We're talking about sound, physical gesture, and imagination. These three components always need to be intertwined in our teaching and in our playing so that we are the most artistic performers of the piano. Sound. We always want to be able to hear the sound that we want to create in our mind before we play it so that when we are producing the sound, it is what we desire. Physical gestures are the ways that we use our body, our physical apparatus in order to create the sounds that are needed. And then imagination is important so that we can use the proper uh, physical gestures as well as create a imaginatory sound that we will be able to cultivate when we play. So how about this little rondo by Atwood? I might ask my students an open question. What season do you think that this piece is portraying? student will give you their reply. Do they think it's winter? Do they think it's summer, fall, or spring? So those open-ended questions certainly gives a student a way to have a, uh, a dialogue with their teacher and also to discover what are some things in the music that inherently sound like whatever season they decided that it sounded like. So there are some two-note slurs in this piece. And this is one of the most basic physical gestures we need to teach our students who want to be artistic. This is the basic drop and roll motion that the student learns in succeeding at the piano. We have the students do this year after year and year after year so that they understand the sound of loud, soft, loud, soft, dropping their wrist and then rolling forward and out of the key. Again, if the student plays without any change in their wrist and forearm and their hand, there is no variation in sound, there's no balance in sound, and there is no beauty in the sound. So let's take a look at this beautiful intermezzo by Brahms. You'll notice that I'm going to be using these drop and rolling motions throughout the whole first page. or her mental conception of it and his inward imagination. So a really good way to think about a dropping and rolling motion, of course, you can go to many, many videos that I have on this website um, from Succeeding at the Piano and all kinds of other pieces that teaches the student how to use that most important physical gesture.
Now let's explore the sound that two different physical gestures make when there are slurred notes. So you'll notice in this The Pfeiffer's piece by Dan Dro that the student plays two note slurs like this. And it's very easy for the student to think about a push off touch release and a push off, as I say in succeeding at the piano, is when a kangaroo pushes off its hind legs and goes forward uh, into, into the land. And the same thing is happening. The student pushes forward and goes um, more to the wood of the piano. So if the student leaves a wrist that is locked, then they get a short percussive sound on uh, the last note, which is not very exciting to listen to. It's not very pretty. So then we have five note slurs. And the student can use either a push off touch release here. So it's like a little spring in the wrist. Or you can have your students think about an ice skater in the Olympics. And before they do a jump, right, they crouch a little bit more, their knees are, are down, and then they spring off their knees and their legs and their thighs. And that's what creates the momentum for their beautiful, their beautiful jump or twirl or whatever they're doing. So that's the same thing with a push off. There are other places in this piece they can also use a push off. Later on in the piece, it might be easier. This one actually is a little bit funnier using a push off. Too much, too much activity. So then the student can resort to just a kick off, right? Staying close to the key and just kicking forward and off the keys. And this time, the wrist and the forearm stay in line with the hand. they can learn through succeeding at the piano as well as good teaching that the push off touch release doesn't always have to be short at the end like this. Then they start to learn that the sound can be longer and the physical gesture will be more, uh, let's say more continuous going to the wood of the piano as in the Rachmaninoff prelude in C sharp minor. in these basic five physical gestures that the students learn so that they can create the right sounds for a particular passage or for, of course, an entire piece. Another great way for students to think about the sound and the physical gesture and the imagination of a piece, as you remember, all three components need to be intertwined at all times. A good way is to ask them about what other instrument, if they were listening to an orchestra or a chamber uh, group, what would they hear? So I'm going to play this Machines on the Loose by Kevin Olson. This is in Succeeding with the Masters, the Festival Collection, Book 3. And what instrument do you think is playing this piece if it were arranged?
do you think? Violins? Trombones? Tubas? Mm, clarinets? Bassoons? <sighs> now this can really create a dialogue between your student and you. To engage our students to think about imagery when they're playing the piano, here are some other good ideas for open-ended questions. Let's see, where are we? On the ground? Above the ground? Below the ground? question for when the students are listening and not looking at the title. The title is called Waves by Emma Lou Deemer. We could ask, what time of day is it? Hmm. Is it morning? Is it sunset? Is it in the, is it in the mid afternoon? What temperature is it? Temperatures are really a good way to have students open up and think imaginatively. Well, is this piece at 60 degrees or is it 80 degrees or does it fluctuate? So those are some really good ways to get students to think imaginatively. So about the sound and the physical gesture, here are some very nice slow rebound staccatos in the wrist. So we can ask our students for when they're playing these, what do these feel like? Are you you've playing with a free arm? Or are you locked in any part or rigid in any part of your playing apparatus? Another thing that we could ask is what about the sound? The more the students play on the pads of their fingers and have a nice supple wrist and forearm, they're going to create a beautiful sound that matches the title of this piece. There's a terrific rondo by Pleil, Ignaz Joseph Pleil, which is in the Festival Collection Book 4. Pleil was a very good friend of Chopin. He was a piano manufacturer and publisher, and he wrote some really wonderful pieces. And this particular work is great as a precursor to the more difficult classical repertoire, even though Pleil was a romanticist, of classical music where students need to learn how to play an Alberti bass. So this is a very good, uh, easier piece instead of uh, Mozart sonata or Haydn sonata. So let's see. Let's talk about this rondo in B flat major. We could ask our students to definitely uh, talk about what kind of mood that this piece puts them in or what's going on in this piece. Is it, is it squirrels chasing each other, children laughing and playing? I need to say that Mozart said the most necessary, the most fundamental thing about any piece is to is to start with the correct tempo and play through the work at the same tempo. So obviously we're not talking about pieces of retardandos and rubato, but inherently the music needs to stay at the same tempo. He wrote that 
in 1777. So let's have the student think about the tempo that they need before they play the piece. So they could just tap the tempo on their little thighs. Robert Schumann says that the fingers must do what the head wills and not vice versa. So we want to make sure that the student is really focusing on listening so that they don't get the tempo out of hand. All right, everyone, thinking about physical gestures in a piece where we need to have a very legato line and all of the all of the notes are actually white keys. This really helps uh, to think about, it really helps to think about how all five fingers need to be the same length. So we need to create a rolling motion in the wrist so that no matter what key the student is playing, the sound is the same. So we don't have any kind of notes that are stuck out. So for example, if I lock my wrist, first of all, the, the tempo or the rhythm would be uneven. And, and there are other there are notes in the in the line that stick out too much. So have the student practice this slowly watching their physical gesture of a rolling wrist, scooping down and around. And so we don't want to have the students reach for any keys. Some methods say, oh, reach for a key. Ah, oh, we don't want to have students reach. Instead, have them shift their arm weight so that they are over the key that needs to be played. Others, other things we can do for imagination, we can use descriptive words. Oh, could you play this piece in a silky way or an oily way, transparent, wet, I and mean, all kinds of descriptive words like this. So this is a good time for students to take a look at your fabrics, which you can get for free at any fabric store. And you get a bunch of fabrics, some that are nice and soft, some that are nice and silky. Here's something that's, I don't know, doesn't feel very good even though it's soft. This is much more um, textured. This one is plastic. This one is burlap. This one is some um, velvet here. This one has nice little sequiny kind of texture to it. And then there is a yellow soft fabric that has bumps in it. And then we have this piece of gauze here. Um, and then have the student go ahead and feel these fabrics while you're playing this piece and ask them which fabric is the most like this piece. Uh -huh. So here we go.
So I can tell you which fabrics they wouldn't choose. <laughs> Probably the one that bur has burlap or the one that is sequined, right? But the, and the plastic one, ah, no. But they might choose any of the ones that are more slippery <laughs> and more soft. So it's up to the student and you can certainly have another way in order to, to have students think about a piece. So remember that all of this artistic playing and thinking about the sound and the physical gesture and imagination is all found at the very beginning in succeeding at the piano. And I certainly um, ask you to look at this method seriously and for those of you that are already using it, I know that you are having great success with your students.